Whereas in the time of the Arabs, though it's a time of ignorance, but they had this tradition. Let's just imagine in Medina, in Mecca Mukarramah, uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu decided to leave the city because the people were bothering him. They wouldn't allow him to read outside aloud. He wanted to make his salat aloud. They wouldn't allow him to do that. He decided, you know what? What point is there to stay in this city when I can't enjoy my ibadah? Let me go and just leave. So he went south and he met this non-Muslim whose name was Ibn al-Daghina, uh, the Sayyid al-Qara, just further south. And he said, where are you going? He says, I'm leaving the city of Makkah. He says, you're not a person who would leave, force, be forced to leave a city or would be, uh, would be thrown out. What's the problem? He says, well, this is the reason. So this non-Muslim, he took him into, back into Makkah and he said, look, I'm giving him my refuge. I'm giving him my protection. Now, when you gave somebody your protection, all your allies, those you had no enmity with, they all have to respect that. Even though the person that's refuge has been given to is going to be your biggest enemy, you can't do anything to him now. And they would respect that. You know, despite all their ignorance, despite all the darkness of the times, right? It seems like in that sense, it was a bit brighter. They, they really, their word really counted in that sense. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Alhamdulillahi wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidin Mursaleen wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa baraka wa sallama tasliman kathiran ila yawmiddin amma ba'd. My dear respected brothers, this is a poem since it's our first week here at this new venue. This is a poem that's probably one of the most famous and most celebrated poet, uh, poem in Islamic history. There's a poem before that which is considered to be very famous as well, but it's not as famous this one. It's called Banat Su'ad, which was a poem said in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam by one of the, initially one of the enemies of Islam who then later came and repented. But this one is from several hundred years ago from Egypt. There was a scholar there whose name was Allama Busiri. And in his middle age, he had a very large family. He had extremely difficult times and a calamity that came upon him. And then what happened on top of that is that suddenly he became paralyzed. So he's got difficulty in terms of financial difficulties. He's got a big family to look after. And then suddenly he's overcome by this disability which paralyzes him. He was a poet, so he had written a number of poets, poems before as well. But then he wrote this particular poem, which we've been studying and looking at very carefully. He wrote this poem privately. And then he went to sleep and the story that's related is that he saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam in his dream and the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam took his garment and gave it to him in his dream. Now he didn't tell anybody that poem. He woke up the next day and he was better. So miraculously, he was better. Now, if anybody's listening to this with disbelief, you can't deny somebody's experience. You don't have to believe it for yourself. But you can't deny that somebody had an experience. Of course, there were people around him who must have observed him in this state of paralysis. And then suddenly after a few days, he's walking. So how does that happen? Allah knows best. It's a historical aspect. However, when he did go outside, there was a person who met him. And of course, this was a very private affair between him and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But he met with someone who then said to him, can you say this poem to me that you said to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and then he gave you his garment? He said, how do you know? This was in his dream that this had happened. He'd said the, dream, he'd said the poem the day before, but then he'd had this dream and who knows your dream, you know? I know they know many things and they snoop about everything, but dreams, I'm sure they don't know your dreams yet. Although they are definitely, there are studies taking place to gauge what people are dreaming about and there's some massive studies going on about that but anyway different story so he says how do you know he says well i had a dream that rasulullah told me that this is what you had done 
Then it became famous what had happened. That's why it's called the Qasida Burda, the poem of the scarf, the poem of the, the sheet that Rasulullah had given him. Now, one is that it's just a poem said in a state, a particular state. You can imagine if you are disabled, par paralyzed, in absolute need, middle age, broken hearted, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, uh, the Prophet وسلم, said that Allah is with the munkasiratul kulub. Those who are broken hearted, Allah is with them. Their du'as are powerful. So when you're in that state, of course, your du'a is going to be special. And poem is one of the highest expressions of any language. That's why they say that if you want to master any language, you have to study poetry. So classically, that's what they did. Unfortunately, in our schools, poetry now for our young kids and everything, poems are, you know, unless you're studying proper literature and so on, it's very difficult for them to memorize. But in any language, whether that be Arabic or anything, poems are the highest expression because they force you to say so many different meanings and articulate them in a very short form using the best possible expression. So poems are one of the highest expressions of any language. But when you have someone who really loves Rasulullah on top of that, who knows his life history very intricately, and he puts all of that life, points from the Prophet's life, he weaves them into this poem. And it's amazing that it's literally like each word is a pearl that he's strung together. And this entire poem, which is of 150, what is it, 160 lines or 160 uh, uh, poems, it all ends with um, me, 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 it's a me, me. -a. So the entire 160 lines of it ends with meme at the end, with a kasra. So we've been looking at this poem, and in this poem, what he does is he starts off very interesting, which you know, you'll have to listen to the previous lessons for that. Uh, because it's, there's a lot of analysis there. But <clears throat> he is taking different aspects of Rasulullah from pre-birth to his birth, to his miracles, to his uh, suffering and everything related. His status. And it's amazing where his mind is going in all of this. It's just amazing how somebody's mind can go so far within two lines, how he can be referencing so many different points and bringing them together both in terms of connecting similar words that have multiple meanings together to pro uh, to provide a particular effect to also dealing with and you have to really appreciate poet poetry to really appreciate this but at least what we can learn from this is the different aspects of rasulullah life seen through the lens of an individual now this poem you know, one is that many poems have been written about Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi but there is no poem, there is absolutely no poem in the world that has had as much uh, um, attention as this one. This poem is still written in the road of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam around around the, the green section. It's written around there. It was it adorned the you know anybody who had a nice house in Baghdad or in Syria in other places Damascus. This is the poem that they would get a calligraphy to, a calligrapher to come and write. It adorns the tomb of Salahuddin and so on and so forth. It's a very very famous poem. It's just amazing. So I was very curious about it for for many many years because I heard so much about it. People memorize it. Young children memorize it. So that's why we decided to look at this poem. So we're on. Number one, uh, number eighty. ما سامن الدهر ضيما واستجرت به إلا ونلت جوارا منه لم يضمي ما سامن الدهر ما سامن الدهر ضيما واستجرت به إلا ونلت جوارا منه لم يضمي ولا التمست غنى الدارين من يده إلا استلمت الندى من خير مستلم and then he says, لا تنكر الوحي من رؤياه إن له قلبا إذا نامت العينان لم ينمي وذاك حين بلوغ من نبوته فليس ينكر فيه حال محتلم. So those are a few lines that we'll be looking at today. تبارك الله ما وحي بمكتسب ولا نبي على غيب بمتهم. So it all ends with me at the end of it as well. So what he says first, ما سامن الدهر ضيما واستجرت به إلا ونلت جوارا منه لم يضمي. Never does this age oppress me, 
but that I seek his protection. His protection do I find and the oppression is no more. Of course, there's a lot of metaphor in there. So we'll be unraveling that soon, inshallah. Never do I seek from his hand the goods of both worlds without gaining my share from the best of all givers. Deny not the revelation in his dream visions, for his was a heart which slept not, though his eyes slept. Thus it was at the outset of his prophethood, so when adult, his dream visions are not gainsaid. Blessed is Allah, revelation is not acquired, nor is a prophet to be accused when he speaks of hidden things. So the first one, never does his age oppress me, never, never does this age oppress me, but that I seek his protection, his protection do I find, and the oppression is no more. Meaning that any difficulty that the author is saying, the author is saying this through, uh, through experience. And look how much, this, this may be a very telling poem out of the whole poem. We, we you know, those who are new to this uh, in the first uh, dars today, they obviously haven't read the previous ones unless you've had any private study of this. But this is, seems to be where he's speaking about himself. He's saying, never does this age oppress me. And he was oppressed. He used to work for the different organizations, the awqaf in, in Egypt. And when he used to see problems, I mean, Egypt has problems right now. May Allah relieve the, those problems. But he saw he had problems in the ministries, in the civil service or whatever it was, and he used to write poems against them uh, about the problems he saw. So he did rack up a few enemies that way because he was just outspoken in his poetry against the evil that he used to see around. So... But he says, I mean, look how comfortable he is and look how much tawakkul he must have had in reliance that the miracle occurred that did occur after he said the poem. So he says, never does this age oppress me but that I seek his protection. His protection do I find and the oppression is no more. He doesn't tell you whose protection clearly he's talking about. But of course, many of the commentators, they've said that based on what he's saying before, this is obviously speaking about Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. How does one seek Rasulullah sallallahu protection right now that he has left this world, he's departed this world? So that's something that we need to understand. You have to remember this is poetry. So in poetry you use a lot of metaphor. You lose, use a lot of figurative expressions. Things don't always, they're not to be taken literally. You know, although in some contexts they are to be taken literally. So before anybody jumps to any conclusions and provides fatwas, you know, preliminary fatwas to this, Let's understand this. What he's saying, the, the author, the poet, what he's saying, Allama Busiri, is that whenever any calamity, any difficulty uh, comes upon him, upon anybody for that matter, so he's not saying this just for himself, he's saying this for anyone, any form of fear, then how, how would you seek refuge with Rasulullah wasallam? How today, if you've got a difficulty, how would you seek refuge with Rasulullah wasallam? Well, different people have done it in different ways. The foremost way which everybody can do, obviously, is that you start reading more about him and you start understanding what he would do. What's his guidance in that regard? That's seeking refuge from him. Sending blessings on him is set to remove our problems. That's another way of doing it. Because when a person sends blessings on Rasulullah as we'll be looking at the, the, the benefits that come from sending one durood sharif, one blessing on Rasulullah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam And Allah sends you 10 blessings uh, We'll we, we look at that a bit later But that's another way of taking refuge with Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Because you know that when you send blessings on Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Something's going to happen You're going to be rewarded And there's a lot of blessing and barakah that comes from that Because it's mentioned in the hadith very clearly So one is to follow his teachings One is to do that And of course there's also other expressions which we'll be looking at, which people have gone. There was a Hindu person who lost his eyesight in India, who with one of the hujjaj, one of the hajis, the pilgrims that were going, he sent a beautiful poem written in Urdu to be read by the rawda of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Pikahe nure khur, ruhi anwar ke samne, and so on. And... He read, the, the, the person who took it for him read it in front of Rasulullah's rawda, and that person regained his eyesight. Right? And this was something obviously observed by people. Again, 
it's an experience that somebody had. Right? There's people who are sick, who are ill, they make a special pilgrimage to the Haramain. They go on uh, in the Kaaba, uh, you know, by the Kaaba in the Haram, they make dua to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Duas are accepted there. They go to Medina Munawwara, duas are accepted there. You know, if, you're, if you get more reward for your salat, there's something going on down there. Clearly, there's something going on down there. I mean, one of the Imam was Sheikh Ghamdi, a beautiful reciter. He was told once, you know, he was offered a place to recite in Medina Munawwara. But he said he found it so difficult to lead the prayer there. Because you're praying and Rasulullah is listening. Because you're right there. Our belief is that when you're there, Rasulullah can listen to you. When you, do, uh, when you send blessings from here, it's conveyed by, a, uh, by an angel. But when you're there, he hears it directly. So he finds it very difficult. And even Shaykh Hudayfi then make a, made a comment. He said, you know, this has been the case each time that I don't know if I'm going to be able to finish my prayer. It must be quite amazing to lead a prayer in Medina Munawwara. You know. So anyway, whenever this difficulty takes place, then a person goes and seeks refuge in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Or he seeks tawassul. So tawassul, tawassul is asking Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala due to the honor, high position, or closeness of someone to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So, oh Allah, I want you to accept my dua and I will just use the name of someone I know to be very close to you. So I come to you and I say, look, you know, can you really help me out? I'm friends with your brother. Right? So that suddenly takes away a lot of barriers between us. Right? You may not still help me, but at least it takes, you know, brings a lot of familiarity. So it's just a means of doing that. It's not necessary to do tawassul, but tawassul for many people, they found it to be extremely useful. And that's what it is. And the Sahaba did tawassul. So now there's a few different opinions about that, obviously. Uh, some people denied outright. They said that it's only restricted to people who are alive. So you can only say, oh Allah, because of this living person's status, according to you, answer my dua. But the, the question then is that if that's allowed and it's not allowed after they, they've passed away, then does that mean that their life has something to do with it? Does that mean you're giving some efficacy and some, bene, uh, some efficacy to their life? That is not, if, if Allah is who you're asking, then this person who's honored, according to Allah, when he's alive, he's going to be more honored after his death because he's now guaranteed that honor because he didn't mess up at the end of his life. He didn't become corrupt. So a person is more secure after their death in their state than they are in their life because you could change. So now this person is definitely honorable in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And if you're asking Allah and he's the giver anyway, so what difference does it make that somebody is alive or dead? Right? So that's a really simple way to look at this and understand this. Yes, in the time of Ibn Abbas, عنه, the Sahaba did go and do tawassul with him, but that's because he had a special position. The family of Rasulullah, they just wanted to do it with him. It doesn't mean that they can't do it with Rasulullah after he's passed away, because there's no dalil against it. Right? So, th that's th the other way to seek refuge with Rasulullah is to do tawassul. To say to Allah, oh Allah, you know, with the special place that Rasulullah has in your sight according to you, then I want you to accept my dua for me. Again, it's not necessary. You can have a direct, you know, you're speaking to Allah directly, but this is just people using means. When, when you say that, when I make dua, and if I say, oh Allah, forgive my sins, and generally the ulama recommend that if you do istighfar, before your dua, your duas are more likely to be accepted, because the reason why our du'as won't be accepted is because of sins that we've committed. So if we've made istighfar, then suddenly we've just taken that barrier away, obstacle out of the way. There's a hadith which mentions that the Prophet ﷺ said that when you do du'a, at the beginning and at the end, send blessings upon me. Because blessings upon me are guaranteed to be accepted. So obviously anything in between is going to be accepted because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't discriminate. When He accepts, He just accepts everything. So... The, the, these are, this all proves the fact that this is definitely a valid opinion. So, the question then is that why should a person not be responded to when they have sought refuge in the greatest and most virtuous of those who have ever existed? Out of all things created and existent in this world, the greatest is Rasulullah 
and that's and the most beloved to Allah. So why shouldn't your du'as be accepted? Why shouldn't your seeking refuge be responded to? And the other thing is that Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam is one of the most generous. After Allah subhanahu wa taala, his generosity knows no bounds. So he has made du'a for his ummah. We're just tapping into the benefit of that du'a. He's already made du'a for this ummah. And he continues to make du'a because prophets are alive in their grave. As has been established by Imam Bayhaqi, Ibn al-Qayyim and many, many other scholars. Only the shallow would disregard that. So, anybody who is in the refuge of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, then they will gain honor, they will gain safety, and they will have protection both in this world and in the hereafter. The best... He is the best of those that you can have any form of security in. As opposed to anybody else, nobody else is as great as Rasulullah is providing refuge. Now, the reason why this concept of refuge is being used here is historical. In nowadays, who cares about what? Whose word means anything today? Presidents give their words and they change. They, they make all of these claims. Prime ministers make these claims and then suddenly everything goes down the drain once they become elected whereas in the time of the Arabs though it's a time of ignorance but they had this tradition that let's just imagine in Medina in Makkah Mukarramah Abdullah uh, Abu Bakr radiallahu anh, decided to leave the city because the people were bothering him they wouldn't allow him to read outside aloud he wanted to make his salat aloud they wouldn't allow him to do that he decided you know what what point is there to stay in this city when I can't enjoy my ibadah let me go and just leave so he went south and he met this non-Muslim whose name was Ibn al-Daghina, uh, the Sayyid al-Qara, just further south. And he said, where are you going? He says, I'm leaving the city of Makkah. He says, you're not a person who would leave, force, be forced to leave a city or would be, uh, would be thrown out. What's the problem? He says, well, this is the reason. So this non-Muslim, he took him into, back into Makkah and he said, look, I'm giving him my refuge. I'm giving him my protection. Now, when you gave somebody your protection, all your allies, those you had no enmity with, they all have to respect that. Even though the person that refuge has been given to is going to be your biggest enemy, you can't do anything to him now. And they would respect that. You know, despite all their ignorance, despite all the darkness of the times, right? It seems like in that sense, it was a bit brighter. They, they really, their word really counted in that sense. So that was a big thing. So he's saying that if that's the case of the way it was dealt with during the, 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 uh, the, the time of the Arabs, then this is exactly what he is saying, that this is the kind of refuge you will get with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa as well. So look where he's taking a historical fact and just to show the strength of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa being with Rasulullah, he's, he's doing that, he's emphasizing that by mentioning the jiwar or the, the refuge of the Arabian people just to show the strength of that so that's what I say it's such a he uses all of these great facts and puts them together to make this beautiful thing then what the uh, what the commentator is saying is that uh, which I explained earlier that there's many ways that people have sought refuge with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he's saying that this is something tried and tested and it will definitely work so one was obviously the story of the poem uh, the poet himself that his paralysis was lifted. Then, especially if a person does a lot of salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, their life will become easy. Because salawat on the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Durood Sharif as they say, it, it makes it very easy, your life. There's a famous story that's related by this Shaykh Salih Musa, who was a blind uh, individual. And once he embarked on a journey, a sea voyage, and suddenly this storm hit them and this was one of those really bad storms which they call the iqlabiya the uprooting one it would it wouldn't leave anything it would just uproot your ship and everybody would perish so people were really worried about this impending storm that's coming in their direction so this particular shaykh he says when i was with them i suddenly fell into a slumber allah does this sometimes he did this happened during the battle of uhud as well nuas Nuas is this slumber that overcomes you. It's this, in the middle of a difficulty, this nuas will overcome you, this a slumber will overcome you, and 
you will be uh, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will give you some safety through that it's, it's amazing that the way that happens in fact there's a hadith in Muslim which speaks about this kind of a slumber overcoming the sinful believers who will be sent to hellfire to be purified that they'll also be and it's not clear so we can't like we can hope for it but it's not clear that we're guaranteed that don't worry about it it's going to be fine um, it mentions there that they, they, they will be overcome with this sleep or slumber it's in Kitabul Iman uh, and by that they won't feel any of the punishment we hope that that is what it means because that makes it does give us hope anyway he says yes I my eyes overcame me and I saw Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in my dream and he was saying tell the people of the ship to say the following words a thousand times and this was a special salawat on the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa which is called salat and tunjina or tunajina many of you probably know it Allahumma salli ala Sayyidina Muhammad wa ala ala Sayyidina Muhammad salat and tunajina biha min jameel ahwali wal afat and, and so on there's, there's a whole salawat so he says that I, when I woke up I remembered, I, you know, it was fresh. I mentioned that to the people and people started reading and they'd read about 300 times and Alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala relieved the calamity. N numerous stories, uh, there are numerous stories uh, to this effect. There's another one, Abu Abdullah ibn Abi al-Khisal, he mentions that once he became disabled, so no longer was he able to move freely. So what he did was, in all desperation, he thought, okay, you know, this is your love for someone. You have love for someone, you will call them when you're in need. So he wrote a, a note in which he wrote a poem seeking assistance from Rasulullah, Shafa'a from Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So he didn't just do it here. This poet, he did it in his hometown and he benefited. But this Abu Abdullah Abil, Ibn Abil Khisal, he sent it with somebody. And he says, go and just place this by the grave. I don't know what he thought in his mind or whatever. He said, just go and put this by the grave. And when he did that, uh, the person went, put it in, uh, by the grave, and he became better. Right? Now, today, they have to stick the carpets down in the roda. That's the only places where the carpets have been fixed to the ground because people do all sorts of stuff down there. And when they have to clean out the inside, there's... Uh, there's all sorts of chitties and things like that that people people write in there subhanallah i mean this is an exceptional case you know this is not the way necessarily to do it this is what came into his mind he decided to do it and he benefited but it doesn't mean that that is you be, that becomes a sunnah to do that ask allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and when you're there then you can speak to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam but otherwise ask allah do tawassul if you have to right but basically he wrote this amazing poem it says كتاب رقيد من زمانة مشف بقبر رسول الله أحمد يستشفي له قدم قيد الدهر خطرها فلم يستطع إلا الإشارة بالكف ولما رأى الزوار يبتدرونه وقد عاقه عن قصده عائق الضعف بك أسفا واستودع الركب إذا غدا تحية صدق تفعم الركب بالعرف فيا خاتم الرسل الشفيع لربه دعاء نهيض خاشع القلب والطرف and then at the end he says وأنت الذي نرجوه حيا وميتا لصرف خطوب لا تريع إلى صرف basically what he's saying is that this is the letter of one who's lying down because of this disability that has overcome him, he is making shafa'a through the qabr of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, the shafa'a of Rasulullah of Ahmad, asking him for shafa'a when he's been afflicted by these difficulties of time and the only thing he's able to do is to move his hand slightly. Because he'd been disabled, the only thing he could do is move his hand. And, and then he continues and then he says that you are the one that, that is, uh, whose, whose shafa'a, whose help and assisted is hoped for whether you, you are alive in this world or you've passed away. And this is the dua of somebody who's, uh, who has this reverent fear in his heart and his eyes are downcast. And anyway, he, he became better. Ibn al-Jala, he says that once I entered Medina Munawwara. I entered Medina Munawwara. Uh, the Medina of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and I'd gone there in those days you didn't have to prove that you've got a hotel and that you've got enough funds to you know pass your time there nowadays mashallah you have to do that but 
in those days you just there were no border checks there was nothing you just went in you know alhamdulillah and you could stay there for a few years if you wanted to so there would be people who just appear there and they just about made it then they've got no money so they're going to do a bit of work or something but he got there probably very late he went straight to rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam's grave he said salam to the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam then to abu bakr and umar radiyallahu anhum then he said ya rasulullah so he addressed the qabr and said ya rasulullah i am extremely hungry i have extreme hunger and i am your guest tonight I mean, what state he must be in? I mean, you need to have some sense of closeness to even go and say that. Otherwise, what are you hoping for? You know? Um, so look, I'm extremely hungry and I'm your guest tonight. And then he went and slept between the qabr and the mimbar. They'll push you out today, but you know, in those days you could do that. I mean, today they, they actually get irritated that you even stand there for more than two seconds. It's like something happens to them, they, especially the... The guy that's standing up there, the police are okay, it's, they just want to move the crowd and just make sure they don't. But the other guys, they just suddenly, something prickles them. When you stand there for one, you know, you're, because you're an innovator if you stand there for more than two seconds. So they just want you out of there. So they get really irrit irritable when you do that. So he says that I just went and slept and there suddenly I saw Rasulullah in my dream. And he came to me in my dream. This is what I saw in my dream. He came and he gave me bread, uh, a piece of bread or you know, some kind of special bread, whatever it was. And in my dream, I ate half of it. And then I was woken up and I found the other half in my hand. Now that's obviously a miracle. It's not going to happen to everybody. Right? It's obviously a miracle. I'd read a story about somebody going to Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam saying salam everybody goes and gives salam but not many people actually hear wa alaykum salam or at least they don't tell us right so i heard the story i've got a friend who's uh, who's from america he's got a convert wife and they moved to medina munawwara right and when i went for umrah a few years ago uh, they did they went they went uh, I was in medina munawwara and we got together and everything. And then after that, late at night, they'd gone to do salam. And his wife was crying afterwards. And he told me this afterwards. He said, my wife was really crying. I was like, why is she crying? Maybe she's just emotional or something. And then he says, after a while, she said that when I said salam, I actually heard wa alaykum as salam. Now, of course, you know, she may be imagining things. You know, you could, you could say lots of stuff. But at the end of the day, it's all about a personal experience, isn't it? So that's what matters. It doesn't matter what people will say about that. Well, you know, until you don't experience it, you're not gonna, you're not gonna understand that. But Subhanallah, now, he didn't get that experience. She did, right? For whatever reason. So it doesn't happen all the time. When my grandfather, for the first time, went for Hajj, my father was with him as well. The first time they entered into the Haram al Sharif. And you know, when you look at the Kaaba first, that's a very special moment. So my grandfather, rahimahullah, he looked at the Kaaba and he turned around to my father and he said, where's the cloth? Right? So my father said, it's there. So he looks back, oh yeah, it is there. So maybe if he hadn't said anything, he could have experienced more. Allah removes barriers and veils, but as soon as he said that, son, now it's going to become magic. And you know, like, no, look, there's no cloth. No, there is a cloth. No, it's, it's gone, it's finished. Right? So, these are just things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could reveal for you because everything is within his domain. Then this, um, this individual who was hosted by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam like this, Ibn al-Jala, he says then after that he, he remained alive for another 40 years or something. And... After that, he would never feel that he had to eat or drink. He would never feel hunger or thirst because he'd been served by Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. That was a special benefit from that because of the barakah of that, that food. Anyway, there's numerous stories about that. And it's not the point of going into the stories. And wabillahi tawfiq. The next poem, وَلَلْ تَمَسْتُ غِنَ الدَّارَيْنِ مِنْ يَدِهِ إِلَّا اسْتَلَمْتُ النَّدَى مِنْ خَيْرِ مُسْتَلَمِي so in this one he says, never do I seek from his hand the goods of both worlds without gaining my share from the best of all givers. Now clearly 
the Prophet's hand is not available today, literally speaking, for you to go and ask for something from his hand. But as everybody knows, this is a metaphorical statement. Right? My hand is with him, don't worry. I mean, you're not. It's just an expression. I'm assisting him or I've provided facility for him to benefit from it. So, again, there's, a, there's an expression here that needs to be looked at. So what he says here is that whenever somebody wants some benefit of this world or the hereafter and they have this desire from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that both the benefits of this world and the hereafter be gathered for them and the person does tawassul with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam now again tawassul has many meanings one is a clear tawassul, oh Allah, give me this through the tawassul of Rasulullah, through the position of Rasulullah. But the other one is, by acting in the correct sunnah manner, that's, the, the, what greater tawassul than that? To act with the sunnah in your life, in your pursuit of happiness, in your pursuit of money and wealth, to do it through the way of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi there's going to be definitely benefits. So there's many levels of that. He will definitely gain his objective. That's what he says. And obviously, the author has had that experience, but he's not restricting it to himself. He's making this as a claim that anybody can do this. So for him, it's definite. It's happened to him, so it becomes yaqeen. It's definitive for him. Uh, of course, for us, it's, we have to have that yaqeen as well. So because for him it becomes like yaqeen, he's saying it's like I've taken it from his hand. Because he has, in his dream, the Prophet ﷺ gave the, 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 the scarf with his hand. So for him this could be literal. But for the rest of us it doesn't have to be literal. It, it's, it's in the metaphorical meaning. The hadith uh, which I alluded to before, Man arada an yas'al Allah hajatan, Anybody who wants a need from Allah, فَلْيَبْدَأْ بِالصَّلَاةِ عَلَيَّ وَلْيَخْتَتِمْ بِالصَّلَاةِ عَلَيَّ Start with praying, uh, sending blessings on me and end with sending blessings on me because Allah accepts both those blessings وَهُوَ أَكْرَمْ مِنْ أَنْ يَدْعَ مَا بَيْنَ And he's too honorable to leave what's in between. If he accepts both of them, he'll accept what's... Ibn Mas'ud radiallahu anhu says, no, it's related from him that... When one of you wants to ask for his need, he should start with praising Allah as much as he's entitled. Then he should pray on our Mawla Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then he should ask for his need. That's the trick. Like if you want to get through to that person, this is what you must say. You know, people give you those advices. So we've just read the story of Ibn al-Jala, where he didn't have to, he didn't have any inclination to food and drink afterwards for a lot, you know, for the rest of his life because of that. That's a dunyawi thing. It's just far and far, you know, far and few apart. But obviously, it's dunyawi thing. Now, you know, if anybody who makes salat on the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, if the only thing that they receive from that was what was promised in the hadith, then that would be sufficient. What's promised in the hadith? Man salla alayya wahidatan sallallahu alayhi biha ashra. Anybody who sends one blessing on me, Allah sends ten blessings on him. That, if that is all, that would be sufficient. How many times have you heard that hadith? Many, many times. Let, today, let's really understand the significance of it. Because really, Ibn Ajiba, he really opens this up. This is what he says. There's a hadith in which the Prophet ﷺ said, Jibreel ﷺ came to me and he said that, Aren't you pleased that your Lord has said, that anybody who sends a blessing on you from your ummah, Allah will send ten blessings on him. Anybody who sends one salam upon you, then Allah will send ten salams on him. There's numerous ahadiths to this effect. There's another one which actually continues and says that whoever sends you one blessing, Allah will write for him ten good deeds. He will erase ten bad deeds and he will elevate him ten degrees. So there's numerous ahadith about that. There's whole books written of it by Alama Sakhawi and there's a the famous Fadail Durud Sharif as well. Qadi Abu Abdullah Al-Bilali, he mentions that understand that when we say that Allah sends a blessing on him, the salat on him, what does that mean? Salat of Allah, blessing of Allah means mercy of Allah. And anybody who Allah has a single mercy on, 
that is superior for that person from more than the entire dunya. So, how much do you think 10 blessings, 10 mercies of Allah is worth then? If one mercy is superior to everything of this world, then He sends 10. So, how much do you think? You know, because sometimes you do wonder in all of these other hadith, it's all about 70 and 100 and 700. But in this one, He's only giving you 10 blessings. You, well, I mean, it's still a lot. You're still getting more than, you know, buy one, get 10 free. And those 10 are from Allah, they're not your ten, one blessing. Then, you know, they're not equivalent to 10 of your blessings. There's one is sufficient. So, you've got 10 of those. How many calamities do you think that's going to take away from you? Now, you're not going to see that because the only way you'll know whether it's going to take any calamity or it would have is if you didn't do it and then a calamity came to you. But if you actually did it and then the calamity didn't come to you, you won't even know that it's come because there's no place you can kind of check that there was going to be an earthquake there or there's some clouds going there or something. You can't check those things. And then... If that's what you get, that it takes away all these calamities and it brings about all of these great benefits and bounties and so on. That's why Ibn Atta'illah al-Iskandari, he says that Man salla alayhi marratan wahida, Anybody who sends one blessing on him كفاه الله هم الدنيا والآخرة This is the value of one blessing of Allah on a person. His causing one blessing of his to send, which is the, his mercy. That will suffice you all your worries of this world. So then he says, فَكَيْفَ بِمَنْ صَلَّى عَلَيْهِ عَشْرًا Then imagine the one who Allah sends 10 of his mercies down upon. But of course, for him to send his blessings, we need to send a proper blessing. Ibn Shafi' says that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has extended the honor of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa to such a degree that Anybody who sends blessings on the Prophet ﷺ will, will be given this status. Otherwise, if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sends you one blessing and you in your entire life do every worship there is and then Allah sends you one blessing, that one blessing of His will be more valuable than all the worship that you have done in your entire life. That's one blessing. Because you obviously are doing what is in your capability. And you're an insignificant human being. That's what we are. Limited. Whereas when Allah sends something, that, that is big. And because Allah is infinite, you can imagine the bounties of that. If Allah is infinite and He has no ending, then the bounty He's going to give us should have no ending, which means that inshallah is Jannah. Because that's the only way to do it. Bounties are not in Jahannam. They're in Jannah. And Jannah is the only place that can deal with the endless life. This world is too limited for that. And this is all if it's just one blessing from Him. So now you understand that when Allah is only giving us 10 blessings for one blessing, it's still a lot. Because that's a huge undertaking. It's big. So what the author is saying here, I have never, never... Ask Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, uh, uh, sought refuge in Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam for something and not been responded to. I've always been responded to and it's always worked out for me. Now, of course, it comes from Allah. But because it's due to his love for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he just said, well, it's him. Because that's his high status. And because generally, you get things from somebody's hand. That's why he used the expression hand. Not because he literally got it from his hand. Although in his, if his dream, he did. The next one is لا تنكر الوحي من رؤياه إن له قلبا إذا نامت العينان لم ينمي. This is a different point. So what he's saying here is, don't deny the revelation in his dream visions, for his was a heart which slept not, though his eyes slept. So this is alluding to a famous hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam. He Earlier on, there was one poem in which he spoke about the splitting of the chest, where the Prophet's chest was split and then his heart was washed. Because of that, there was a level of purification, high level of purification that he received. When he receives that high level of purification, the nur and anwar and the, uh, the, the blessings, are, you can imagine uh, the Prophet's heart is a greater receptacle for that, more than anybody else. 
So if he's getting all of these blessings from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, sleep can't overcome him. This is one way to understand why he said, I don't, my, eye, my eyes sleep but my heart doesn't. Because the heart is being washed. Our heart is corrupt so we need to sleep, we need it's the nourishment of the heart. But when it's being purified by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala like the way it was with a special water, then it suddenly becomes super. It's different. It's immune to these things. That's why the author says, don't deny that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala could give wahi to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa in his dreams. His dreams are also wahi. And this is agreed upon that the prophets, their dreams are wahi. Because although he seems to be asleep, his heart is very much alive. It's related in a sahih hadith from Aisha radiallahu anha. She said, Ya Rasulullah, see, he used to perform his tahajjud long time at night. Then he used to sleep, uh, lie down for a while. Then he used to get up and do witr prayer. Right? So he used, to do, he used to lie down, then he used to even like be snoring in a sense. And then he used to get up and just do witr prayer without doing wudu. So she was a bit worried. She says, how come, you know, she's, she asked that question. Are you sleeping before you pray witr? He says, don't worry about it, Ya Aisha. My eyes sleep, but my heart doesn't. And that's why whenever the Prophet ﷺ was asleep, they generally would not wake him up. Because they know that he's in control. So there was no need to wake him, hey, salat time or whatever. You know, they would generally not. The other thing is that you didn't want to disturb his wahi. He may be receiving a revelation, so you didn't want to disturb that either. Now, what you have to understand, just slightly digressing, the dream world is a world that you enter after you leave the wakeful state. And whatever your experiences are in your wakeful state, that's the kind of dream world you will enter into because that's what you're used to. It's got to do with your mind, your thoughts, a lot of this. And then it's interaction, with your ruh's interaction with the angel of dreams, the special angel that's designated for dreams. So if you have good thoughts in the daytime, your thoughts in your dream will also be good because that's the kind of natural world, that progression that you will go into. Otherwise, it's going to be bad. So if somebody's getting bad dreams at night, well, just think of what you're doing in the daytime. A lot of women complain about, I see bad dreams and they get really paranoid. But I mean, are you speaking bad about people during the day? Are you ghiba? Are you doing all of these weird things that you do so at night? It's going to come back to haunt you, generally speaking. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is pure. So his dreams are pure. The angel is having, you know, giving him great uh, wahi and revelation, bringing what, what he has been told to now, the question that arises is that if the Prophet ﷺ is not asleep, well, he is asleep, but his heart is awake, then why was there that occasion where they all missed Fajr, including the Prophet ﷺ? They overslept. So anybody who misses Fajr, they should feel that as a sense of comfort that it's a human thing, even to Rasulullah it happened to him. But how do you reconcile the fact that his heart is alive, awake, and he misses Fajr? How is that possible? Well, there's a number of um, responses to that. First and foremost, that time when they overslept, that was a special situation. So although in the majority of cases his heart was always awake, but in that particular instance, for a particular example, to establish a point for everybody afterwards to benefit from, he was put asleep. Right? He was put asleep. Because the Sahaba could have missed it, and he could have been awake, but then why didn't he wake them up? Do you know? So the, it would have been, Allah knows best why he did what he did, but he just made everybody asleep. And then they woke up, and then they did a jama'ah of qada, a qada jama'ah of fajr, after sunrise. So it was to make it, how to deal with it because you know people are gonna sleep it's a natural thing so how do you deal with it if you sleep so it's for that reason that's why in the hadith uh, narration of ala in an, one version of the hadith the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam said Lo sha allah la iqadna. if allah had willed we would have woken up but walakin arada an takuna sunnatan liman ba'dakum. allah wanted this to be an example for the people after you of how to deal with a missed prayer there's already people who claim that if you miss a prayer on purpose, you don't have to do qada, you just do tawbah. They do agree though that if you miss it by mistake, 
or sleeping or something, then you have to do qada because of this hadith. If this hadith was not there, then they'd even deny that. Ibn Abbas, عنه, this is what his expression was about this incident. He says, ما يسرني أن لي الدنيا بما فيها بصلاة رسول الله صلى الله عليه وسلم الصبح بعد طلوع الشمس. If I was given the entire world and I prayed Fajr that day, that would not have been more valuable to me than my Salat in Qada with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam. That's more valuable to me than if I'd been given the entire world. Right? So it's a major rukhsa, it's a major concession that yes, you can do your qadha prayer afterwards and inshallah will forgive you. That's one, re- one answer. The other answer is that technically speaking, the eye is asleep, the heart is awake. But what's the sun, the sunrise, got to do with the heart? The eyes are asleep, so you miss the sun. So technically seeming there's, there's, there, there's no conflict here. Right? Number two. And number three is... When he says my heart does not sleep, he's referring to the fact that my heart doesn't sleep, it's not in a state of heedlessness, it's still connected to Allah, so I receive wahi. So that's what he means by being awake, that I still receive revelation in that time. And finally he says, وَذَاكَ حِينَ بُلُوهِ مِن نُبُوَّتِهِ فَلَيْسَ يُنْكِرُ فِيهِ حَالُ مُحْتَلَمِ These dreams... This was the dominant thing that he used to have revelation in his dream at the beginning of his prophecy. It says that six months is when he got these dreams. Then after that, he still had dreams, but then he used to also have revelation openly. Either Allah directly inspiring his heart or coming through an angel. So he's saying that there's no way you can reject this. So what he's saying is, thus it was at the outset of his prophecy. So when adult... His dream visions were not gainsaid. So the revelation, earlier revelations that he got were in his sleep. And later on, it became even more complete. That it no longer just had to be in his sleep. It was also in his wakefulness state. And that's why they say that the the hadith mentions that the only thing left of prophecy today is pious dreams, righteous dreams. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't talk directly to people. And if there is any message that he gives now, it's actually through dreams. Some hadith say that it is, how many parts of prophecy? One of? 46? 40. There's narrations that range from 40 to about 70. So the ulama have explained that for some people it's 40, because their dreams are stronger and more truer. And... Those who are not as pious, their dreams are more veiled and obscure, and they're not as clear, then theirs is one seventy or even less. Right? So that's like a spectrum of truthfulness of dreams, the all the hadith, that's how you put them together. Okay, so inshallah we will end here. And inshallah we'll continue afterwards. But this particular line is just to show that it starts off as dreams but then it became even more intense and that's why he says thou thus it was just at the outset of his prophecy he got true dreams then so when adult and the word he used in arabic is muhtalim muhtalim is the one who is now mature so um and again the word muhtalim in arabic although it means mature it also means ihtilam also is to do with dream so again there's a play on words here so he says, when adult, his dream visions were not gainsaid. There's a few other poems I'd like to. Mir Ali Sher Qani, he says, to cleanse the mudded thinking of the people of my age, pure water from his fountain, when versed will thirst a soj. It's a bit complicated, it's, it's a poem, right? Both worlds are just the golden radiance an exhaustible book of signs and reflections. But where is the lighthouse to light up our journey? Beauty's wellspring of light. That's a poem by Emin al zuwaita And midnight was rich with musk, drifting from his lips so fair. The moon was a sickle at dusk, like a shoe from his steed in the air. That's Nidami's poem. 
Let's make dua. Allahumma anta salam wa minka salam tabarak ya dal jalali wal ikram. Allahumma ya hayyu ya qayyum bi rahmatika nastaghith. Allahumma ya hannanu ya mannan. La ilaha illa anta subhanaka inna kunna min al-zalimin. Jazallahu anna muhammadan ma huwa ahlu. Allahumma salli wa sallim ala sayyidina muhammad wa ala ahli sayyidina muhammad wa barik wa sallim. O oh Allah, we ask you to forgive all of our sins. And we ask you to forgive our heedlessness. O oh Allah, we live a life full of heedlessness and negligence. Though we acknowledge, we claim, and we declare that we believe in you, and we are your believers, and we come to the masjid, and we do a few things, but our hearts are not connected to you as the hearts of the Sahaba. We ask that you give us true spirituality in our hearts, a purification of our hearts. O oh Allah, we send blessings on your messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Make it worthy of those ten true blessings that come from you. O oh Allah, make them suffice us for the problems that we have in this life and the calamities. O oh Allah, strengthen us from inside and out. O oh Allah, make our inside superior to our outside. And make our outside pious and righteous. O oh Allah, make these things easy for us in this world that we live in that it's so difficult. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, we ask you to protect us from all of the challenges and all the problems that we face around us. O oh Allah, these things don't seem to be getting easy. O oh Allah, we hope that it's not because you're angry with us. O oh Allah, have mercy on us. O oh Allah, become pleased with us. O oh Allah, make us worthy of your pleasure. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, you seem to be extremely angry because of all of the difficulties that are taking place. O oh Allah, grant us intuition of what to do to remove that, that state and to make you happy. O oh Allah, it may be because of our sins that many of the calamities are taking place in this world. We ask that you forgive us and you inspire us in the right direction and you protect us. O oh Allah, we all have this desire but we fall prey to our sins, our whims, our desires. O oh Allah, we ask that you drag us and you force us into your submission despite our states where we don't want it. O oh Allah, O oh Allah, we ask that you shower your abundant blessings upon us and you shower us your abundant blessings on us and our children. Elevate the kalima la ilaha illallah in this world. O oh Allah, you make us a means of assisting your deen to be of service of your deen. O oh Allah, we ask that you give us the true love of your messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and you give us a true following of his message and his sunnah so that on the day of judgment, we're not left alone and we're not isolated away from your mercy and away from his generosity. O oh Allah, we ask that you give us to drink from his hands, from the qawthar. And O oh Allah, that you give us his company in the hereafter and that you send your abundant blessings on him on behalf of us and you give him, you give him an appropriate reward on behalf of the entire ummah. O oh Allah, make the best of our days the day that we stand in front of you and make this world easy for us to live in, in Gaining your happiness. Subhana Rabbika Rabbil Izzati Amma Yasifoon Wa Salaamun Ala Al-Mursaneen Wa Alhamdulillah The point of a lecture is to encourage people to act, to get further, an inspiration, an encouragement, persuasion. The next step is to actually start learning seriously, to read books, to take on a subject of Islam and to understand all the subjects of Islam at least at their basic level so that we can become more aware of what our deen wants from us. Uh, and that's why we started uh, Rayyan courses, so that uh, you can actually take organized lectures uh, on demand whenever you have free time, especially, for example, the Islamic Essentials uh, course that we have on there, the Islamic Essentials Certificate, which you take 20 short modules. And at the end of that, inshallah, you will have gotten the, the basics of uh, most of the most important topics in Islam and you'll feel a lot more confident. You don't have to leave lectures behind, you can continue to, leave, uh, you know, to listen to lectures, but you need to have this more sustained study as well. Jazakallah khair and assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.